So Peter, can you talk about when you first uh, looked at Twitter and what, what you thought was interesting about them and what, what caught your eye about the company at that time? Yeah, we first saw Twitter about the same time as the rest of the industry when they hit at South by Southwest. And the instinct that we had at the time, while not certain, was that they'd stumbled onto one of the primitives of, of human communication. And what's interesting about Twitter is that, as someone had said, it's the network we all discovered we needed after we used it, but we, no one knew we needed it in advance. And I think there's certain companies in our world that come along uh, that don't just change the technology industry, but they actually change humanity and they shape how we uh, interact with one another. They um, actually change the nature of power. And you know, Twitter, while it wasn't obvious in 2007 at South by Southwest, felt to us like a company that we had to understand. And we uh, invested about a year and a half later when they had 25 people. And at that time, uh, it might have been obvious just in terms of momentum. And you could see the usage, you could see the network effect, and we had deep convictions about the business model. I think some companies are born with the potential to monetize, others struggle. Twitter was, even at 2009, uh, dominated by both commercial uh, and personal usage. Brands had found Twitter and were using it to promote. And so, so you saw that potential even though they didn't have advertising in, in the beginning? One of the great questions at Twitter was, how will they make money? Right. And I think the same questions were asked about Google. In both cases, the companies are distribution platforms, so they point the user to the broader web. And we did have strong convictions that if they could scale to a large number of users, to hundreds of millions, if not billions, that their power of discovery, similar to a search engine, a discovery engine can point people to things that might have economic interest. And inside of Twitter, there's always been this buoyant economic offer-based, promotion-based usage of the product by brands. And so we saw that and thought you could amplify that. Given where they are now, do you think that they've answered some of those questions? Do you think that they're getting to that point in terms of address, you know, realizing some of those things you saw back then? Well, we've often pointed out there are two major misconceptions about Twitter. And so until they deal with those misconceptions, I think they uh, won't be at their full potential. The first is, I think people wrongfully bucket it as a social network, when in fact it's a communication utility. It's one to many, not one to one or, or few to few. And I think Twitter as a broadcast network um, doesn't require the same kind of analogies to companies like Facebook or Pinterest or, or the equivalent. Uh, so that perception of Twitter as a uh, broadcast network, I think, is one of the things that the company's focused on. The second is that you don't have to tweet to use Twitter. And it's similar to being a broadcast network. It's values in consumption and discovery and connecting you to what's most interesting and important to you. So the company's ambitions stand out in our universe to get to billions of users. And because it's a mobile product principally, they believe that the natural size of their network is 4 billion users. And so it's, in our view, very early days at Twitter. Mm -hmm. they're, they're on, and in terms of their, their ad products, they rolled out new products, they're, ro they're continuing to roll out things. You think that, that they're realizing things on that, on that side of things? We've been astounded at the response to the advertising products that have yeah. launched. We have a number of portfolio companies that have come to us and said their cost of acquisition on Twitter is lower than any other medium. And so I think for a period of time, Twitter could be the single best ad unit on the internet. Um, as it grows and it becomes more efficient, that may not be the case. But at, at the moment, it's a fantastic place to acquire customers, to tap into influencers, to shape the dialogue. And you see that in politics, you see it in consumer brands, you see it in our tech startups who are using it to acquire customers.
I don't think any benchmark partner should be on the Midas list. I think only the benchmark firm should be on the Midas list. Unlike other firms, we don't know how to operate as individuals. We operate as a team. Having been in a different model and a different firm structure, uh, the reason that Benchmark is named Benchmark and it's not named after any one of us is that there's a certain degree of being egoless about this job. The best, best, best since we've made Twitter, eBay, Instagram, there's not one partner that brought the investment in. It was a team that brought it in and we don't isolate who did it. We never mm -hmm. create that kind of internal competition. It's only focused on the outside and on the customer and the entrepreneur. So I started as an infrastructure software investor and stumbled into the consumer internet with Yelp and, and Twitter and, and Polyvore. And what we discovered in that was there was a very different set of values in a consumer internet company. They're product-driven companies, not sales-driven companies. And a have a sales force. And they, they have a sales force later in life. Right. And what we discovered is that you could take product-driven entrepreneurs and back them in the, in the enterprise market and achieve orders of magnitude more scale than you could with a sales-driven model. So product-driven entrepreneurs care about usage of the product. They care about delighting the user, the consumer science of is the user getting what they expected. Sales-driven companies care more about big quotas, enterprise briefings, uh, top-down, convince the gray suits. And what's exciting in, in the moment that we're in right now is that we're investors in companies like Dropbox and Zendesk and New Relic. They've achieved scale that you would be impossible to get to in a classic sales-driven model, which is a ground war, because they're running an air war. And they're allowing for ubiquity and proliferation of the product experience. And then on top of that, they layer the revenue model. So we haven't yet seen these companies go public. Uh, they're in the wings, but their number that are scaling through 100 million in revenue in the next 12 to 18 months. And I think they're going to reshape the dialogue around enterprise, and it's going to look much more like product-driven companies, and that's why you talk about Dropbox and put him in, and Drew in the same category as, as a Jack Dorsey or a Mark Zuckerberg, and I think that era is just starting to be unleashed. And is that, are those the kind of companies you are still looking for on the, on the enterprise side? We are looking primarily on the enterprise side for entrepreneurs that have the product sensibilities and instincts that we would see in the consumer internet. The ability to delight the user, to remove friction from when you want something to when you get it. There's, there's a generation of people, the millennials, that have grown up with broadband access with the idea that they've configured a very complex software product, be it Facebook or Twitter, and they have the know-how to do that with their enterprise tools. And so entrepreneurs that come from that generation and can speak to that consumption model are, are I think, going to shape the future of the enterprise. You guys did um, Instagram, so that was, a, that was a big recent win. Yeah, well, credit to the team at Instagram. Kevin yeah. is one of those entrepreneurs with Mike that... Uh, you fall over yourself to try and invest in. And we dream about entrepreneurs that have a mission, a purpose that goes beyond the money. And I think Kevin shares that with the very best entrepreneurs where the motivation, why they do the job and why we ser serve them is to change the world. I think you know, the, the outcome in many ways um, is a byproduct of the vision and the mission. And so we try and focus more on the, where they wanna go and, and, but celebrate victories when they occur. And one, one last company, Polyvore, is that, is that one of your companies it as is, well? Yeah. Can you talk about that one and what, what, what you like about them? What we're excited about with Polyvore is that it's, it's a consistent thesis to what you would see at Wikipedia or the company we most wish we'd invested in, GitHub uh, or Yelp where, or TripAdvisor, where a small group of people are creating beautiful content that a mass audience can consume. And I think you see this also in companies like Pinterest. So Polyvore has the largest community of fashion creators on the web and they have 15 to 20 million uniques every month that come to, to consume that content and there are no editors and creative uh, set they create sets as the object of that that gets viewed um, like a pin board their view is a set uh, and the community generates all that content so it's the creative destruction of the media business model when the users create the content it's curated and, and, and put into a format where it can be digested by the mainstream and it's changed the way people discover fashion trends. It's changed the way they discover what items they want to buy. Uh, and there's all sorts of data and analytics that come out of that, which give you a sense of where the world's going in fashion that wasn't possible before.